good evening. I am, my heart is full of gratitude. First of all, I love this house. This center is like um, very dear to me because I have so many friends, so, so many beloved friends. Not only friends, but beloved friends. And, um, and two, I'm so happy to have the opportunity for us to study together. Because this book, I, I was talking to Marcelo earlier, is um, the good news. It's a book that I say every spiritist should read once a year <laughs> to remind us really the deep uh, understanding of the teachings of Jesus. Um, you are studying this for a, a while. So you know that uh, Umberto de Campos had the chance to go in the spiritual uh, realm and go to the files in the spiritual realm and uh, have the details, the um, making off, <laughs> yeah. right? The making off of all the passages. We are not going to find this kind of information well there. If you go and Google, for example, this part of Jesus having this conversation with Matthew, you, you won't find it. So it's a, um, a really a gift that when we say we have really a gift in our hands because we have the information. And to deepen that information into our lives, to understand, to live, to think, to vibrate into the teachings of Jesus. So the Sermon uh, on the Mountain, and I think in Portuguese we say the Sermon, uh, yeah, the, yeah uh, the Monte, but usually we say mountain. mountain. Yeah, right? Yeah. But in reality, it was not a mountain. It was a little mount <laughs> yeah I've been in Jerusalem so there is not really big mountains right small mount, a mount. so uh, this chapter it's only the Sermon on the Mount is only Matthew you are not going to find in Luke or Mark and John just in Matthew and um, it's it's a collection it's um, it's uh, Matthew from 5 to 7, so it's very long. It's the Sermon of the Mount. It's a collection of sayings of Jesus found in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, which emphasizes his moral teachings. It is the longest of the teachings of Jesus in the New Testament and includes the Beatitudes, the Lord's Prayer, and central tenets of Christian discip discipleship. I love that because the Lord's Prayer is only in Matthew. And was, you know, uh, Matthew wrote during the Sermon of the Mount. So um, if you have the opportunity after we study to go back to Matthew 5, 6, and 7 and read it, you will have a different understanding. Okay? So to start, I got this thing of uh, Muhammad Gandhi. He, um, he said so many things about Christianity. He really loved the teachings of Jesus. He would always say, I love Jesus. I don't like so much the, the Christians, but I love Jesus. Or he would say, there is another saying that he said, if all the Christians will really follow Jesus, the world will be Christian. You know? So, because I think what the point is to live the teachings. And as a spiritist, that's our mission, our individual mission, to live, to follow Jesus as an example. In um, the, the Spirit's book, the um, question 625, the Spirit tell us that Jesus is our guide and model. So to learn about his teachings or to study the Boa Nova, the uh, good news, we will understand exactly what Jesus wanted from us. Right? 
So he said, I don't know, oh, it's a little bit fuzzy. Uh, the message of Jesus, as I understand it, it contained in the Sermon on the Mountain, an adulterate and taken as a whole. If then I had to face only the Sermon on the Mountain and my own interpretation of it, I should not hesitate to say, oh yes, I am Christian. Right? But negatively, I can tell you that in my humble opinion, what passes as Christianity is a negation of the Sermon on the Mountain. Why did I put this there? <laughs> Just as a reminder for us as a spiritist. And he takes the Sermon on the Mountain. He, he also said that if all the books will be burned and lost, but the Sermon on the Mountain will be saved, humanity will be saved. So it's such a, a beautiful um, passage of Jesus, and that contains actually everything that we need. But for us, the Spirit is, again, is our, our example, how we live our lives. It's less talk and more, you know, walk the walk <laughs> and more doing, right? So. Okay, so before, let me go back here. Um, before we start, really, uh, I'm sorry, uh, our study is until 7 or 7.15? 7 7.20, Okay. All of you are done by 7.30. 7.30, okay, yeah, because I love to talk. <laughs> <laughs> to say at Ponto de Luz, I, I never finish my slides, <laughs> that I have like 10 more slides, right? So, <laughs> and this is so good, I can feel the energy of everyone here and the spirits around, and um, so it makes me want to stay, I'm at home. <laughs> so, um, I, I wanted to introduce uh, for the study today. The idea again, why Jesus came, why this high spirit, this pure spirit, the governor of our planet has uh, had to come to live among us, to, um, to teach us something, right? But what's the main reason he, ha he had to come? To show us by, action. by actions, yeah? But to show us by action what? Love. To love. So he came only for us to show us to love because now that's uh, the concept of a lot of people. Jesus came to teach us how to love, right? But that is not the main point. <laughs> no. That is in John, because we have to understand he came, he was born in the Jewish heritage, and there is a point in that. The Jewish people lived their lives to have this alliance with God that they broke a long time ago, right? So all their lives was to maintain obedience to God. And that obedience to God came through sacrifices, purity code, right? They have to purify themselves all the time. They have to follow all the rules. They have to go to the temple because in the temple is the moment they had um, this connection to God. So it was a way of life of a lot of exterior, you know, um, try to maintain this uh, uh, alliance with God. Making this point, he comes, Jesus comes, come to teach us a new way to have this alliance with God. Heligare, right? Heligare, to have this connection to God. So in John, there is a part that is so clear about this, that he tells that the only reason he came is to teach us that. 
my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their, their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus, Jesus came to teach us how to be in connection with God. That is the reason he came. And he came to teach the way. And love is one of the ways. Forgiveness, trust, compassion. There are so many layers of this, this um, path. But our, his main idea is, I'm going to bring you to God. And once you are with God, I will bring you life in abundance. That is life, to be connected to God. And when we are connected to God, are we afraid? No. There is no fear. Is there separation? Yes. Is there separation? No. No. no, no, no. <laughs> no. no. Is there, is there uh, exclusion? No. no. There is brotherhood. There is fraternity, solidarity. I see God in you and you see God in me. I see my brother, and you see a sister, right? So there is a difference in that. So I'm saying that because that's why the reason in the third chapter of Bonova, he has this conversation before he starts his teachings with a high priest that later on it's going to be one of the high priests that is going to uh, condemn Jesus. So he has this uh, conversation about he came to build the kingdom of God, to bring the kingdom of God. And the conversation was about where is the kingdom of God, who are you to do it, right? And he said that I came to build the kingdom of God in the heart of the man. So Jesus comes and changes completely the perception, the paradigm that the Jewish people had about a Messiah. The Messiah, they were, he, they were waiting for a Messiah that will, would come and end the domination of the Roman Empire, would come and will fight for the rights, would come and would um, build an exterior kingdom of God with kings, with high priests, what? With the elite, right? And so when Jesus said, listen, <laughs> forget about it, okay? The kingdom of God is in you has to be so in, inside of you that is in Luke the kingdom of God is within you it's not outside of you it's inside of you it's through your emotions through your sentiments through your actions you will prove that you are with God and God will be with you Right? So that idea is important for us to understand uh, before we really start <laughs> the text, to have that, that perception that what really Jesus wanted and how the um, disciples were understanding. Because we can see until the end of Jesus' uh, uh, teachings, the disciples didn't understand him. They were clueless. They were even afraid at the end, even though Jesus told them, 
everything that was going to happen, right? They were afraid. They didn't have the faith. So I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Through what? Through the example. That's why the question 625 in the Spirit's book say it's through the example. It's to live our lives as Jesus lived his life. If God could be among us, Jesus will be the ambassador, <laughs> right? That was what it was. It was God, in a way, living among us when he said, I'm with the Father, and the Father is with me? He was with God, and this is what he was invited us to be, to be with God. And to be with God, there is a lot of layers of acceptance. Because God, when he created us, he already loved you. He already accepted you. And that is the layers that we have to take from us to understand that the love is already is in us. The acceptance is already in us. And the fear comes from that, that we don't feel that yet, or we don't trust that already in us. Any, any questions? <laughs> Everything is fine? Okay, I just want to lay uh, our way into the text. And the text is really long, but I decided to read most of them, not all of them, but most of them, and then we will, you know, kind of taking the really the substance that is um, beautiful, the way um, Umberto de Campos wrote. So um, maybe it's better if I stay here, not there, right? Mm -hmm. Here. Okay. Oh, okay. Here. So chapter 11, the Sermon of the Mount. As the first rays of the good news had been spread, all sick and unfortunate inhabitants of Chorasi, Magdala, Bethsaida, Dalmanuta, and other important villages around the lake eagerly filled the streets of Capernaum. The disciples were the most targeted by the masses due to their constant contact with their master. Occasionally, Philip was assaulted on the way by a surge of the sick. Peter had the house surrounded by the jacket and sad people. Everyone wanted the aid of Jesus, the immediate benefit of his mighty virtue. In the early days of the apostolate, a small group of unfortunates sought for Levi in his comfortable residence. They wanted explanations about the gospel of the kingdom in order to work with more decisiveness in their efforts to observe the teachings of Christ. You. Um, Probably you, you notice that I, some of the words, it's in bold. See, sick, deject, and sad people, and you will see throughout because there is a reason for that, okay? So you can understand that Jesus, he chooses a region that was a very simple region, full of farmers, full of fishermen, not really the elite that they had in, in Jerusalem, right? Very simple people. Capernaum had like 50 or 60 houses. It's a very small village, and most of them were fishermen. Um, I was like Googling how life was at the time, and they say uh, Galilee, um, they found that they didn't have even a, 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 what do you call a warehouse when you storage and storage. Um, they didn't have any. Huh? No, it's like a, they didn't storage food. For example, they consume all the food. You know, they uh, they gather like uh, fishing or or uh, farming. So it was like a, not a very um, rich city. It's very simple with simple people, right? So you can understand. And when Jesus starts his um, uh, teachings, 
one of the things uh, Jesus did, which is amazing, right? Uh, I think at the time he had this wit of uh, how am I going to grab the attention of people, right? So what he does, he starts healing people. And because we have to understand at the time, there was so many messiahs at the time. It's not only Jesus. Every day there was a new messiah, right? And Jesus was a different messiah because he was not a warrior. He was not saying, I'm going to um, make the Roman run away from here. We are going to fight. That was not the way he approached. He approached first healing people. And through the healing, he would teach. He would speak to the masses. And so suddenly, Jesus became this pop star, <laughs> right? Everyone wanted to talk to Jesus. And Jesus was talking about the kingdom of God, a kingdom of God that will accept everyone, a kingdom of God that the, the poor, the sick, that the jacked, the sad people would be welcome, right? And then, um, of course, the disciples were the managers, right? <laughs> Jesus. Everyone wanted to say, can I talk to Jesus later? Can we? So they're all on top of the apostles. So I think it's wonderful that Umberto de Campos really show us how life was at the time, right? Um, so Levi is the name in Hebrew of Matthew. Matthew is the name in Greek, of, but it was Levi. So this is the way Umberto de Campos writes Levi all the time. So um, they went. It's important to see. What we are going to talk about Levi a little bit ahead, but that Levi has a comfortable residence, right? And uh, Umberto de Campos makes sure that we know that he lives better than the other apostles, right? So we will see why. Oh, wait, here. The tax collector was his profession. He was, um, uh, Levi was a tax collector. The other 10 were a fisherman and one was a merchant, which is Judas, right? The tax collector of the city was a bit dumbfounded. After all, said Levi to the unfortunates who saw him, the new kingdom we gather all sincere and good-willed hearts who wish to live together as children of God. But what can you do in the situation in which you find yourselves? And turning to the three of them were his personal acquaintances, so they were friends or he knew them, right? Levi spoke with conviction. Lysander, what uh, will you be able to accomplish since you are crippled? And you, Aquila, were you not abandoned by your own family under the weight of serious charges? And you, Paphos, would you be able to build anything in light of your current, current afflictions? The ta challenged individuals were crestfallen and humiliated. Only then they finally recognized their grievous shortcomings. Levi's rude words awakened them, and endless pain had taken them in. So let's understand, because uh, this, uh, this chapter is the re-education of Levi. <laughs> let's, Jesus decides, let's educate Levi into the teachings of the kingdom of God. So we have to understand who was Levi, right? According to the Bible, St. Matthew was one of Jesus' 12 apostles and the first author of the New Testament. And it's interesting because in um, Paul and, and Stephen, is Stephen that we say in English? Mm -hmm. Paul and Stephen um, by Emmanuel, uh, the first scrolls, were written by Matthew. So it's clear that the first um, uh, text that they had for the teachings of Jesus came from Matthew. And Matthew, uh, he was born in Palestine sometime in the first century. Saint Matthew was one of Jesus' 12 apostles and also one of the four evangelists 
according to the Bible, Matthew authored the first gospel of the Bible's New Testament, not, uh, now known as the Gospel of Matthew. Prior to preaching the Word of God, he worked as a tax collector in Capernaum. But we know more, a little bit more, more about him through uh, Boanova and through other books. He was a tax collector. It means that he worked directly with the Roman, with the Roman Empire. And for the Roman Empire to trust a Jewish man <laughs> to deal with the money, so probably Matthew was a very well-educated man, which is very different than the other apostles. He was the, um, uh, what, how can I say, the elite, the, um, uh, the high education aristocracy in that matter with around the apostles. And because he was a tax collector, he earned good money. So he had a very comfortable life, a very comfortable home. He was a successful person in terms of finances, uh, which is different uh, the other uh, apostles. Uh, besides, he spoke uh, Greek as well. Greek as, at that moment was the English. Everybody, you know, that uh, travel had to speak Greek. So he spoke Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. So he was a well-educated man. And he knew how to write, which is uh, the, the other apostles didn't know how to write and, and read most of them. So he was like, let's see, aristocracy <laughs> around the apostles, right? And, um, and because of his background, you have to understand how he saw the society at the, that, that time, and which is a little bit how we see the society. That's why I put a lot of all the, those words sad, the crippled, the, the afflicted, because what he does, let's go back here. He questioned the three men how can you help establish the kingdom of God with all your problems? Because for him, in his view, who would establish the kingdom of God will be somebody that is healthy, is wealthy, is very intelligent, <laughs> very well spoken, was elite. And that was the idea of Matthew. He didn't see, he said, okay, everybody's going to be part of this, but you are not going to work in the front. You are not going to be, you are crippled, you have problems, you are failure, you are unsuccessful, you know, as a man. So you are the bottom of the society. What? Do you think you are going to be here with Jesus and us? Right? And it's interesting because when somebody is very intelligent and has sometimes um, the, um, the art of the words, he can convince you that you don't have a value, <laughs> right? He can convince you that you really, you are crippled. He said, oh my gosh, yeah, what am I doing, right? You, you are like your family doesn't want you. And you want to help us doing the kingdom of God? God doesn't want you. And they believed. They believed. This is how his mind was. And then we are, it's beautiful, this book, because it's, I say, is the re-education of each of the disciples, right? Because Matthew was with Jesus for three years all the time for sure there's so many stories with jesus and matthew right but umberto de campos only chooses this one just one this is the only story about matthew in in good news just that why we have to ask ourselves why and the disciples the interesting thing is you have to understand that we all have some of the characteristics of the disciples. 
we too have that, and we are going to understand a little ahead. Um, if you have any questions, ask, okay, then yes. <laughs> yeah. Please, please you open that uh -huh. door. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, it's like in his saying, actually, he starts very well when he was saying, well, we're going to gather everybody who has a who has a good heart. Mm -hmm. But then he starts to point to the, the problems of the others. But that has nothing to do with good will and, mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. good heart, right? Mm -hmm. So I think we do that all the time. Like we know in theory, what is that? Yeah, the fear is just the goodwill and all mm -hmm. that. But then we think, and then he was like, in practice, he was not um, doing what he just said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. And, and besides, I, I, I think he really was excluding them, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because this is how the society works at the time. And we have to understand, we are going to go through how the poor, how the sick, how the blind were accepted in society. You know, if you have leprosy, you would be outcast. So Jesus really came to talk about the outcast of society, right? And uh, we are going to see ahead. In his affectionate preaching, but that was a good point. Even him is, he's saying something that probably Jesus said it, and he's repeating, but in his own thoughts and inner you know, beliefs, he said, no, 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 you can't help us, right? In his affectionate preaching, Jesus had said that his love had come for all who were grieving and feeling anguish in the heart. When the master arrived, they experienced the restoration of their energies. Joyful, they kept his promises regarding the just and good father who loved the unhappiest ones, renewing in their hearts the purest of all hopes. They found themselves exhausted, but the lesson of Jesus brought new consolation to the helpless souls with no material comfort. They wanted to belong to God, to vibrate with the exaltation of presence of Christ. However, Levi's word had thrown them back to their wretched condition. This group of poor and unfortunate individuals withdrew in dismay. However, the master would preach on the mountain that afternoon. Perhaps he would minister the lessons that they needed. So that day was the day he did, he did the, the Sermon of the Mount. That exactly, that is interesting because I think that is the greatest thing that Umberto de Campos did. He did the making up of the Sermon of the Mount. <laughs> right? He did. He showed us what happened before the Sermon of the Mount and why the Sermon of the Mount, now in my view, became bigger, grand. So, so we have to understand how the people, like, the sad, the unhappy, the unsuccessful, the outcast, everyone that Jesus actually came to console, to give, to give the perception that God accepts everyone, that God loves everyone. There is a space and a place for everyone in the kingdom of God. The only thing we need to do is to open our hearts, to clean our hearts, to heal our hearts, to, be, to accept the invitation of Jesus, right? So who is the people that Jesus helped that were looking for consolation? The poor? Who else? The sick, who the else? Cripple. The cripple, who else? The blind, the blind. who else? The hungry, the, hungry. Criminals. the criminals, the, the prostitutes, the group, <laughs> a big group, right? And do you know who was outcast at the time? That is so funny and we're going to laugh. 
the tax collector. Ha ha. Do you know when the poor doesn't like the poor? <laughs> the tax collector for that uh, society was outcast because he worked with the Roman Empire, right? So Levi thought of himself better than the others, but the society didn't like him. He was too outcast. And many times the Pharisee is told Jesus, you, you eat with prostitutes, you eat with tax collectors. That's a great point, right? It's when we have prejudice for people who are who you know live in in the bottom of the society. That's why I said, do you know when the poor has prejudice about the poor? Oh, right. <laughs> do you know? <laughs> and this is a characteristic that so many times we carry when we are immigrants in this country, and sometimes we have prejudice to other group of immigrants. You know, the beauty of the gospel is that the gospel is for us. It's not for my neighbor. It's for me. For me to question my beliefs. To, to, for myself to question what am I carrying in my heart? How I see the world, you know? And how I act how I think. So, social outcasts in Palestine at the time. So we have the Samaritans, right? They were the outcasts. We have the lepers. People with any kind of uh, disease in their skin, and they didn't know what it was. They were like outcasts of society. So if your father, your mother took care of you all your life, loved you, if something happened in their skin that seemed to be a leper at the time, leprosy, you have to tell them to leave. And they have to live in a region with the people around with leprosy. So uh, it's, it's very interesting because we have to understand how the society really uh, was at the time. And Jesus came to, to kind of change the view, the idea, the paradigm, what is really a society based in love and compassion and forgiveness and inclusion. Romans, too, were outcasts. And all the other outcasts that we, we, we talked about, right? And I think the next one is there. Like, Jesus was an outcast of his time. He hung out with the bottom dwellers of society. Tax collectors, adulterous women, lepers, the poor, the sick, right? Would Jesus be an outcast today? No doubt. So that, those are the questions, and we are following Jesus. That, those are the questions. That's why the, one of the slides I show uh, Gandhi talking about the Christianity, because uh, the teachings of Jesus are it's the consolation of our hearts, but we are not living that. And that is the strange thing, right? 2,000 years passed, and we still cannot tolerate one another, <laughs> right? I'm not talking about love. <laughs> I'm talking about, okay, I t I'm going to tolerate this situation, okay? Right? Am I wrong? No. Otherwise, we will live in peace, at least respecting one another, respecting the differences between us, respecting even how you think that is different than me, but I will give you respect because I will give you what I have. We, give, we don't give because we don't have. We are not really walking the walk. 
And I'm not pointing fingers. It's just a question that we have to do every day. Do you know, it's like St. Augustine every day. You have to start thinking about your day. How was your day? I did a lecture, like, uh, I think last three weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago. I don't know if you were there. But I, were you there? Yeah. yeah. And so I put, a, I said, Jesus came to change the vibrational field of the world. Okay, that's it. <laughs> now that we had physic, uh, quantum physics, it's so easy to talk about that, the vibrational field of the world. And how do we change that? Really working on the virtues inside of our hearts. So you have to understand, so I, what I did, there is, um, I forgot the name of this um, doctor, but he did the vibrational of every emotion. So we, he said, we have to vibrate 20, uh, 200 hertz up, which starts with courage. <laughs> everything like shame, guilt, you know, disgust, everything's 200. Uh, down, <laughs> below, right? If you live your life with resentment, with guilt, with shame, with disgust, do you know, you are vibrating very low. So uh, what I said, like doing parenthesis, I said, I don't know why spiritists talk about umbrau all the time. It's like the main, uh, you know, concern. I'm going to end up in Numbrau. And I said, why? Why are you? Are you, where are you vibrating? It's just logic. It's just logic. Are you resentful? You don't forgive? Are you anger, uh, angry? Do you carry hate? Do you... Do you know, what do you carry in your heart? Because this is the vibration where you are going. If you discarnate right now, this is where you are going. It's like uh, you are planting and you are going to receive, right? So, of course, we don't vibrate in love all the time, 24 hours, of course, of the day. Sometimes we are a little sad or jisper or something happened. But is the quality, the most quality of your vibrations through the day. Do you carry gratitude, compassion towards others? Are you a good friend? Do you know? Do you take care of your family with love? Those are the vibration. Do you know that we have to have most of the day? Respect. So your vibrational field will go up, and that's what it, this is what Jesus wants from us: elevate, elevate the vibrational field of the world, peace. So when we pray, we ask for peace in the world, blessings to people, blessings to our leaders, blessings to people that we don't like. You know, I, I always uh, always j uh, joke about that. I have a little notebook. Notebook I write the people that sometimes I really don't feel like comfortable with, and I pray for them. And that's what we have to do: pray for the people that don't like you, or you still have difficulties with that, right? Pray for them because you're wishing good things to them. Pray. And it's in the beginning is hard. I guarantee in 21 days, you change a habit, right? In 21 days, in 21 days will be easy because that happens to me. You know, that happened, happened to me. So, so continuing. So, so we see that Jesus actually came for those people that Matthew was saying, you don't have you know, ability or space to do this job, right? After a few moments, Jesus entered Levi's house, accompanied by Andrew, where they started talking lively. At one point in the conversation, the tax collector naively reported the earlier occurrence with a smile. Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> He's really happy. Jesus, you don't know what just happened. <laughs> right? <clears throat> These people come here and they are thinking, right? So he joyfully finished his report with these words, what could the gospel of the kingdom achieve with the cripple and the beggars? Right? And <laughs> but suddenly, recalling at the other fellows were poor and humble individuals, he added, which fellows? The disciples. The disciples. <laughs> Oops, <laughs> and who's in there? Andrew, next to Jesus. <laughs> Very uncomfortable, right? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's what he's so, he's going to say. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about you, right? Because, well, yeah, no. But be, there is a reason that he would say that. Um, suddenly he called. Oh, so it is fair. It is fair to expect something from the fishermen of Capernaum. They are fearless and strong men, and they do a good job. So they are not crippled, they, they are healthy, and they can be, you know, <laughs> do you know when the war, you throw the soldiers in the front, so like they can go, right? Power. Huh? The, muscle the muscle power, exactly, right? The muscle power, they can go. Um, uh, but I don't see how to accept the contribution of the unfortunate and defeated who seek for us. So it's really interesting, right? Because he's among the fishermen. <laughs> Fred is laughing. It's like Umberto de Campos, he's a genius. Because he comes and brings us really how Matthew and Levi thought about even among his, you know, friends, <laughs> the, the other disciples. He said, okay, but they, we can accept them because they are, at least they are not sick. They're not very intelligent. No? They don't have a high education, but they're strong men. Right? That we can expect at least something from them. <laughs> I, I wanted to see Jesus' face. <laughs> For sure, Jesus had a lot of compassion. He said, oh, little children, I'm going to educate you in really what's, um, why I'm here, right? Jesus stared at the disciple with deep zeal and kindly spoke while patting him lightly on the shoulder. My son, listen to me, right? It's good, do you know what, I, life, we have to go through life with, it has to be enjoyable and fun, right? I always say, when I see a spiritist, uh, <laughs> really, who wants to join the kingdom of God like that? <laughs> Seriously. Do you know I said, we have to be the poster of spiritists. <laughs> and I had an encounter with a friend of my uh, husband who is a Catholic, and I felt so bad because I crashed a little bit with her, but the, at, the, at the end she said, I wish I could understand the way you understand because you are happy all the time. And that was like, at least something <laughs> came out of there, right? Because this is what we have to be. The first teaching of Jesus is where? It's a big feast, right? It's the wedding. It's a big feast. Because Jesus is coming to tell us the kingdom of God is happiness, is joy. You know, it's interesting because in that emotions and vibration, love is 520 something, but happiness and joy is higher. It's higher. So happiness and joy can really <coughs> strengthen your immune system, can really give you a boost in life. Right? So we have to think about that. Even that's a gratitude. Sometimes when you say, 
uh, say thanks to everything. I think Paul said that, right? Just go through life saying thank you, thank you, thank you. Have this gratitude because life is perfect as it is. And we feel like, oh, life is perfect because everything is good, awesome, it's good. But life is perfect, even in pain. Because the pain that life brings us is telling us that, or we have to change something in our lives, or we have to understand things differently. So life is perfect as it is, right? So. So here, the education or re-education of masses, right? However, Levi, the need to love and accept the precious collaboration from the unfortunates of the world. Since the gospel is the good news, how is it not to be God's message for them, the sad and forsaken in the immense human family? The victors of the earth do not need good news. In the mishaps of life, individuals hear the voice of God more loudly. Seeking the oppressed, the afflicted, and the slandered, we feel them so close to heaven in their hopes that we recognize in the quiet courage that they reveal a sublime reflection of the presence of our Father in their spirits. Have you observed any victor of the world with a higher concern than to defend the fruit of the material victory? Levi felt moved and enjoying a little pause, he exclaimed somewhat disappointedly, Lord, my observations only come from my intense desire to have the supremacy of the gospel among those who rule the world. He, at least, he was very honest. Not only him, but Judas, the same. He thought that Jesus needed the elite to back him up. But Jesus chose to be born not in the palace. Because the, he chose the first... Um, virtue lesson to teach us is to be what? Humble. Humble. And for us to connect to God, we need that virtue. Because without that virtue, we cannot walk the walk. It's the first one. When we think that we know everything, that we are better than others, we disconnect to God because we exclude people. In the kingdom of God, there is no exclusion. God rules the world, stated the master with convic conviction, and love does not act with apprehension. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. God rules the world. We think we are going to solve the problems of the world, <laughs> right? We think with our blah, 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 we are going to convince people of our truth. But Jesus says, love does not act with apprehension. Love is patient. Love is love. Love is not fear. And he, his motivation was fear. If it's not with the lead, we can put the gospel, you know, the, the gospel out. No one is going to follow. But Jesus was gathering other kind of people. Why? Why do you think they need, he needed the sick, the forsaken, the unsuccessful? Because their hearts were more open it's over there eh? when they, they say the victors of the earth do not need good news in the mishaps of misfortune of life individuals hear the voice of God more loudly. Mm -hmm. yeah, when we lose everything it's like uh, do you know when you are going to prepare you have um, land to prepare to plant 
but there is rocks, there is branches, there is stuff, and you have to clean. Have to clean, 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 clean. It has to be clean for you to start putting the seeds. So Jesus saying that those people already started to clean their interior, their hearts, because they don't have anything that made them I'm important in this world, right? I'm important in this world. So let's go back here a little bit. Uh, I think I'm passing, right? Yeah. So God rules the world. I like that. I remember I did this study a, a, a little while ago with a group that we studied this book. And I said, why do we fear so much life? It's because we don't trust that God is in control. Do you trust that God is in, in control of your life? Apparently, we can say, yeah, I trust, right? I trust, but when there is a problem in your life, you get in despair, right? You shake, you, oh my gosh, right? Am I wrong or am I right? Because this is what happens to me, right? One time, a friend of my spirit has told me that my daughter didn't come back home, I start this is years ago, like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, calling everybody. And she said, I thought you, ha were, you had more faith. Do you know? <laughs> and I said, and I thought that you understood me. You, you, and I said, I said a terrible thing I had to say. I said, you're telling me that because you don't have children, right? Oh like I am the right to be in despair, right? Not that I could not be in apprehension, but I could, you know, drink the water, what do you call the water of, uh, no, 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 she, she, uh, the water of peace, you know, do a little <laughs> prayer, breathe in and breathe out, right? <laughs> no, it's like, oh my gosh, calling everybody, like, shall I call the police, you know? So. That was a good um, lesson for myself. Uh, we need to walk the walk. <laughs> we need to walk the walk. So that is one of the good things. God rules the world because Jesus had a plan. And in the eyes of Matthew, Jesus doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> Jesus, you need to be with the people, with the with the powerful, those fishermen, those cripples, right? So after that, in the, in the uh, text, there is a little bit more, but it's a lot about this. Uh, so after that, Jesus goes to do his sermon, and by the mount, we're gathering all those outcasts, all the people that really wanted consolation, healing. They wanted to belong. Because for you to understand the time, the temple was the place that people would go in Jerusalem to connect to God, it was the house of God, right? The blind could not go in. The cripple could not go in. There, it was forbidden for them. There is a reason. Do you know why? Because if you cannot walk by yourself, you don't deserve to be with God. So when they talk that the outcast wanted to be with God, before I said, they wanted to be with God. They wanted to have that opportunity. And Jesus was saying that, I bring the good news. Follow my teachings. Follow what I'm saying to you, and you will be with God. That's a big consolation. And he, they follow him because he belie they believed he was the Messiah. He was sent by God because he was doing healings that no one 
was doing, right? So, okay, the point is, why Humberto de Campos chose this passage, the making of of the Sermon of the Mount, of the Mount because we don't know if that sermon without this conversation will be different. The Sermon of the Mount starts with the Beatitudes, right? What is the first Beatitude? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Oh, the, in theirs, yeah. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And blessed are the merciful. Look at the Beatitudes. Jesus is talking to whom? To all the outcasts that Matthew was saying you don't belong to the kingdom of God. Do you understand? So it's interesting because we don't know. Probably Jesus was planning a different sermon that day. <laughs> and because of that conversation with, with Matthew, he said, no, probably. I don't know. I'm just guessing, right? The Sermon of the Mount start saying the opposite. Who is going to be with God? Are these people. He made sure that Levi would listen to this. And he wrote it. Right? It's in, in he wrote it. He lengthily talked about the kingdom of God where love will build everlasting and sublime wonders. His promises seem directed to the immeasurable human future. From the top of the hill, a soft wind blew in delicious waves of perfume. The breezes of Galilee were impregnated by the powerful and indestructible virtue of those words and obeying a superior design they would be spread among all the afflicted of the earth. And I will say, all the afflicted of the earth, because we all are the afflicted of the world. The rich is the afflicted of the world. The poor is the afflicted of the world. The leaders are, because we all have our darkness. We all have our problems. So if, if somebody comes here and says, I don't have any problems, you will say, what's your problem? <laughs> right? What's your problem? Yes, we do have problems. We are the afflicted. That's in the uh, gospel according to the spiritism. It's the longest chapter. It's about the afflictions. Otherwise, we would not be here. We would be in Jupiter, right? We would not be here. We are here. And there is a reason. We are among, uh, together, because there is a reason. Because we have to learn from another. We have to cooperate with one another. We have to love one another. Accept one another, forgive one another, and forgive, and forgive, and forgive, and forgive. Because we want to be forgiven, so we forgive, we accept. In that unforgettable dusk, Levi felt a different emotion taking over his soul. He then understood those who abandon worldly illusions do so rise themselves to God. He noted that the ranks of people were taken in by an immense comfort. Among them, the disciple realized that the humble friends who had visited him in the afternoon were descending the mount 
embracing one another with an expression of great happiness as, as if boundless joy propelled them forward. The tax collector of Capernaum approached and greeted them overflowing with joy, realizing that the teaching of the master in all his light would encompass the infinite future of the world. Great hope and indefinable peace penetrating him deep inside. And I love this last word, uh, last uh, phrase, great hope, indefinable peace penetrating him deep inside. Because, come on, when you have to put a face that you are the big shot, it's very tiring, right? It's like, finally, he felt that, okay, I can be a failure. I can make mistakes. I can be normal. <laughs> it's allowed and great peace. So I think Humberto de Campos chose this passage because if Jesus didn't have this conversation with him, the whole Gospel of Matthew will have a different kind of vibe, direction. Don't you think so? Yeah. Because the Gospel comes from the experience too. It's not only, we always say here, right? A lecture will not, a lecture maybe will change a little bit our way to think, right? But it will be really my, my expression of the gospel with my life that will change people, right? It's the expression of the gospel in everyone's life that will move people. <laughs> exactly, there is a reason for everything. And even yeah. the sermon itself would be different. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, yeah. this was such an introduction that uh, the conversation with, mm -hmm. uh, with the creeper. Uh, the uh -huh. And when he delivered this beer to us, mm -hmm. it's just like such impact, the yeah. beauty and the connection, then just can't yeah. uh, ignore this power so immense. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the greatest teachings of God is, um, is the inclusion. Is the inclusion and our willingness to accept his invitation. But is the inclusion. And I always say, now the kingdom of God is in our hearts, right? So I have to say one thing to you. You have to include everything in your life as well. And that was an insight I had the other day, watching a lecture. And I think Family Constellation talks about that a lot, too. That Jesus came to build that kingdom of God in our hearts and our lives. So the inclusion includes our failure, our, you know, missteps. <laughs> includes everyone that was part of our lives. That's why I came to my house the other day, parenthesis, okay? <laughs> Just a, a funny thing. Um, I told my husband, I said, listen, I have to change the way I talk now. He said, what do you mean? He always like, what do you mean? What do you have? Like, uh, now when I have to talk about my ex-husband, I would say, husband number one. <laughs> And husband number two. <laughs> he said, why? Because I can't take him out of my life. He's part of my life. He's part of my journey. I am who I am because I have the experience with my husband number one. Right? And so there is no ex in our lives. There is no ex-friends, no ex-anything. It's the experience that we have to include because it's part of our world. And, and in that way, we make peace. And we forgive ourselves, too, for the missteps that we made. And then there is no guilt, there is no shame, 
There is just that moment that I did what I did because I was at that moment. And I accept that. And I am grateful for that because made who I am today. And that is very powerful if we think about the inclusion that Jesus was like asking for us to do outside, but for that has to be first living in and inside of us, accepting our journey with the good and the bad. I really love the work you recorded about the emotional frequency. So for those that want to Google later, it's called there are two things, map of consciousness and an emotional frequency chart. Yeah, I think that's it. Emotional yeah. frequency yeah. chart. Yeah, really it's, cool. it's very cool. Really. Yeah, because I think when I showed at uh, um, Ponto de Luz, people could see it. Oh, ah, that's where we have to be. <laughs> it's like, yeah. And stop with this umbral thing, okay? <laughs> be happy, be faithful. Be grateful. You know, Paul told us that. Be grateful. Just be grateful. And when we are grateful, we are including everything in our lives, right? So, so look at the beauty. At the end, this is the last part of uh, the text. On the next day, on the next day, Matthew changed completely his perspective, his perception. On the next day, the former publican opened his doors to all guests of that memory dusk. <laughs> Come, I'm going to spend my money now with the crippled, the sad, unfortunate, right? They are my friends now. When Levi embraced the cripple, uh, he, uh, <coughs> Jesus attended the party. I love because it's a party. It's a celebration, right? No long faces as Christians, please. No long faces as stretches, <laughs> please, right? Jesus attended the party. He shared the bread and rejoiced with them. He shared. And it's beautiful because it's so symbolic. Jesus is always, you know, sharing the bread. And it, this is sharing everything we have, right? When Levi embraced the crippled Lysander with the sincerity of his faithful soul, the master gazed at him tenderly and said, Levi, my heart rejoices with you today because blessed are those who hear and understand the word of God. It's beautiful, right? You got a little star from Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. High five, high five. You got it. You got the lesson. <laughs> high five, right? Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So, so just a reminder, I, I like to talk, see, 7.20 right now. A reminder, the true spiritists can be recognized by their moral transformation and by the efforts they employ in order to dominate their bad instincts. So it's always our daily work, right? It's always, we don't need to be perfect. Remember, we have to be humble, knowing who we are. Oh yeah, I still have this. Oh yeah, I still, but I'm, my effort daily to love more. I always say, people want to talk about that um, darkness, right? I said, don't put your emphasis on your darkness. Put the emphasis on your, what you have already, the light you have. That's why Jesus said what? Take your lamp and make it shine, right? Right? Let the little shine, right? So we have to put the emphasis more in that, right? And then, maybe at the end, we get a start from Jesus too, right? <laughs> um, because he came, I came to give you life more abundantly the real life. So what is the real life? In five minutes we are going to, I have two more slides, I told you, I never finish my slides. Uh, what is the real life? This is the real life? No. No. 
This is a temporary life. The real life is a spiritual life. So if our real life is a spiritual life, who are you? Matter or spirit? Spirit. A spirit. So why we are so attached to the matter if we know we are more spirit than matter? Right? That's a question. Like a faith. Understanding. Understanding, mm -hmm. yeah. The reason why you said I was going to give an example so beautiful yesterday in the symposium of art in Jersey. There was a short movie that uh, the people from Long Island or Connecticut, I don't know, made it. It was so beautiful. Huh? From Connecticut. Mm -hmm. About a blind man and a son. So the end of this passage, the son is holding the father's hand, walking in the sidewalk, and he said to his father, his father is blind. Father, when I grow up, I will be like you. And the father looked at him, blind? He said, no, father, like you. So uh, that, that kid saw the sense of the father. Mm -hmm. He was not worrying about if he was blind or crippled or poor or rich or Republican or Democrat or Republican or immigrant or American. But he saw the, the sense, the spiritual sense, and he was capable to grasp that. Yeah. He saw the father with the abundance that his father had as yeah. a, a father. Yeah. Do we see on a lot of that? Yeah. Yeah. And that's what, when we, our eyes are ready to see with the eyes of Jesus. We see, you know, the spirit there. We see one another looking at the eyes, right? Looking at the eyes. Today, I was going to my center, it was, um, and I took the... Um, it was so interesting because... And I start to question even myself when I see a homeless on the street, mm -hmm. right? Usually we don't want to, most of people don't want to deal. They don't even want to look into their eyes, like they don't exist, right? So I, w I was taking the subway with my son and, um, and there was two homeless sleeping on the, like hanging out, sleeping on the, the benches. And I'm passing and uh, one of them look at me and smile. And his smile made me smile back. And he said, how are you, beautiful? I said, great, have a great day. Yeah, yeah, we start talking, right? And I thought about that. Like, he is the poor, the crippled, the sad, but he had the eye for me to give me a smile. And that's like, see, sometimes it's all those people who are really <laughs> understanding the situation, right? So, uh, but the point I wanted to go is why are we not more aware of that we are souls? Because this is what Jesus came to tell us. Listen, don't be attached to here because the real life is it's not here. Don't be attached. Go through life loving, forgiving, being the light, being connection to, to God, but don't be attached. That's why we cannot serve two gods. Right? No. We got, but we cannot forget that we are living here. So security, survival, safety are part of the ego that brings us back and it is important. But that cannot lead us in life. And this is what Jesus came to teach us. That cannot lead us in our life. We have to, uh, there is a, a phrase of Jesus like, I, uh, how, how do you say that in English? I, I, eu venci o mundo. I overcame the world, right? And you can do, because he had control of his desires. Hmm? It's so it's a, prob a problem of perception. And so for us, uh, to finish, I, I gathered this, um, I, I used this slide in a, one of our, my lectures before. The egos and the souls express of reality. It's just a reminder. Like the, the egos 3D experience of reality, death and decay, separation, isolation, form and mass, limitation, lack, fear. Those are the things that the ego, right? And today I was, we were talking about time and space doesn't really exist for the spirit, but exists for the ego. 
There is a time, there is a space, there is a matter, right? It's 3D. And the, the soul, the spirit, lives in another reality. It's being, connection, energy, possibility, abundance, love. And so those are the connections that we have to see. Where are we living more? We are more putting more emphasis on the fear, on the limitation. I can't do it. No. No. Let's put more emphasis on the soul experience of reality, right? And the invitation of Jesus, come, follow. It's just an invitation. But I will say how he said to Emmanuel, right? You have a choice to follow me now or in a thousand years. <laughs> we will follow Jesus. will be now because of our will, willingness, or could be in a thousand years. But there is a moment that we will follow. So why waste our time, right? So that was, uh, any questions? <laughs> no? It's a beautiful chapter. It's a beautiful book. I feel like uh, we as a spiritist should read this all the time. Um, uh, every, once a year at least. Because it's a reminder of really the importance, the direction that as disciples of Jesus, <laughs> right? Um, we should believe in his, um, his teachings. God bless everyone. <laughs>